Um, welcome to the second keynote. My name is Marius Kozak, and I'm an assistant professor of music theory at Columbia University. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Maxine Sheets Johnstone, who describes herself as having had two lives. In her first incarnation, she was a dancer and choreographer, as well as a, a professor of dance, having appeared in numerous performances and choreographed them as well. Uh, she's currently affiliated with the uh, uh, University of Oregon, where she holds a uh, courtesy professorship, and she is a philosopher dealing with uh, animation. Uh, she has published numerous um, monographs and journal articles, including the uh, widely cited uh, The Phenomenology of Dance, uh, illuminating, illuminating Dance, uh, The Roots of Thinking, The Roots of Power, The Roots of Morality. It's always nice when we get to the roots, right, of all these issues. But all of them dealing with animation and the body. And one of my favorites, uh, The Corporeal Turn, an interdisciplinary reader. Um, she's been awarded uh, the Distinguished Fellowship by the International, the Institute of Advanced Study at uh, Durham University, uh, an Alumni Achievement Award by the University of Wisconsin, and is being honored with a scholar's session at the 2012, I guess that was being honored, <laughs> uh, the scholar's session at the 2012 meeting of the Society for Phenomenology and Existential Philosophy in Rochester, New York. Please help me welcome Maxine Sheets Johnson. <laughs> charged in straightforwardly significant ways as well as subtle and complex ways both to the animate form itself and to those attentive to it. Animation is not only a linguistic affirmation of aliveness as opposed to deadness, but a linguistic affirmation of movement. Species within the kingdom of Anomalia move. Even sessile ones do at the beginning of their lives. Given their ubiquity on this earth and given the, given the moving earth itself and the integral moving bodies that constitute earth itself, bodies of water as large as oceans and as small as raindrops, to say nothing of the air we breathe that manifests itself in fluttering branches and howling winds, movement, movement, clearly more is our attention. To understand movement, it is necessary to begin by eschewing those wayward definitions of movement that deflate it and turn instead to those dynamics that are its living reality. This initial turning of attention to the phenomenon's living reality is akin to the beginning steps of a phenomenological methodology in that it confronts the actual experiential nature of the phenomenon in question. In turn, it has the possibility of bracketing all manner of received wisdom, all assumptions, all preconceived beliefs about the phenomenon. For example, though received wisdom tells us otherwise, movement is erroneously defined as change of position. In such a definition, movement is necessarily linked to objects in motion objects which may indeed have a starting point and an ending position. It is, however, that unelucidated change that constitutes movement and our experience of movement. 
When a fully blown balloon, for example, is purposefully untied and allowed to splutter about, it creates a particular qualitative kinetic dynamic. While the balloon is clearly an object in motion, what we experience in attending to what we verbally label spluttering is a vigorous, erratic, highly punctuated, wholly capricious flow of movement that ends in a sudden collapsing stillness. What captures our attention and is at the heart of our experience is movement. We experience, indeed, a qualitative kinetic dynamic. In effect, movement is not equivalent to a change of position, and neither are understandings of movement equivalent to understandings of objects in motion. Movement is equivalent to movement to core. A further example of the way in which received wisdom, assumptions, and preconceived beliefs compromise movement centers on space and time. Movement is not simply a force in space and in time. When commonly so conceived and described, the integral dynamics of movement go unrecognized. In particular, we fall short of acknowledging and grasping the inherent dynamics of its complex spatio-temporal energic structure. Certainly a walk across the street is a walk in space and in time, and a walk that involves a certain measurable degree of energy or force. But the walk across the street is a dynamic phenomenon in and of itself, meaning that it creates its own spatiality, its own temporality and energy in its very execution or performance. The walk might be slow and proceed with small mincing steps, for example. It might be rushed and proceed with long, forward strides. It might veer off suddenly to the right or to the left. It might be vigorously or lethargically energized, and so on. In short, a walk, any walk, has spatial, temporal, and energic contours. By the very nature of its movement, it is a particular, qualitatively inflected, dynamic through and through. Moreover, its contours may be changed at any moment. We might be surprised by the sight of a friend ahead and spontaneously change our walk to a run, at the same time raise our arms in, in preparation for a greeting. Or we might get caught up in the dread we feel about the meeting we are about to attend, slump down, slacken our pace, even pause and shudder. In short, the qualitative kinetic dynamics of everyday movement are always mutable. We can change those kinesthetic kinetic dynamics virtually at will, which is to say that space, time, and force are inherent in any movement. In effect, when we move, we are not simply moving in time and in space, but creating a specific spatio-temporal energic qualitative dynamic a dynamic that we experience and that we that and that is readily experienced or open to experience by anyone around us. Aristotle was eloquently insightful not only when he observed that nature is a principle of motion and change, but when he immediately urged thereafter, we must therefore see that we understand what motion is. For if motion were misunderstood, so too would nature. In her book, God's Hotel, A Doctor, A Hospital, and A Pilgrimage to the Heart of Medicine, medical doctor Victoria Sweet recalls Aristotle in singular ways. She writes of anima, the classic Aristotelian term for soul. In lieu of soul, however, she conceives anima as, quote, the invisible force that animates the body, that moves it, not only willfully but also unconsciously, all those little movements that the living body makes all the time, in the slight tremor of the fingers, the pounding of the heart that shakes the living frame for a second, the gentle rise and fall of the chest, those movements by which we perceive that someone is alive, unquote. Sweet's medical practice is literally enlivened by anima, by her own anima 
and by her recognition of the presence or absence of anima in her patients. Her description of efforts to resuscitate a dying man where standard efforts to resuscitate were denied by the administration of the hospital where she worked is remarkable. With a colleague, she instigates what she calls ancient measures. Quote, I called Ming Tan, that's the patient's name, and I shook him. And Dr. Mack started to move his legs. I even slapped his face a few times. And sure enough, Ming Tan's pulse returned. It became quite steady. And then his eyes opened and stayed open, staring at me. In my first autopsy, I'd been surprised by the difference between the dead body and the live Mr. Baker I'd once known. There was something missing. And now, with Mr. Tom, I'd caught it. I'd seen it go toward death, stop, change its mind, and come back. I'd seen anima, that which animates the body and the mind. Anima and dynamics go hand in hand. They pulse through us, inside and out, which is to say that the dynamics of a whole living body pulse through all forms of animation. The dynamics of breath pulse through our movement, for example. Those dynamics are or can be alive with meaning, with import, with a felt bodily resonance and a felt bodily resonance apparent to others. Consider, for example, two insightful observations of Sir Charles Bell made close to 170 years ago. In his third edition of a book called The Anatomy and Philosophy of Expression, published in 1844, Sir Charles noted that, quote, the first sound of fear is in drawing, not in expelling the breath. For at that instant, to depress or contract the chest would be to relax the muscles of the arms and enfeeble their exertion. To make the point more strongly, Sir Charles asks the reader to imagine two men wrestling in the dark, asking whether the violence of their efforts would not be apparent from the sounds they make. He quotes, saying, the short exclamation choked in the act of exertion, the feeble and stifled sounds of their breathing, all would be known to us that they turned and twisted and were in mortal strife. Anima and dynamics, we breathe in and out. Our breath rises and falls. A built-in, fundamental, binary rhythm is at the heart of our being. That fundamental binary rhythm is mirrored morphologically in two arms, two legs, two hands, two feet, two eyes, two ears, two breasts, two testicles, two lungs, two nostrils, two hip joints, etc. It is moreover mirrored in our natural bipedality and in our consequent natural binary rhythm in walking and in swinging our arms in walking. Our natural bipedality anchors our conceptual three-dimensional bodily specifications of up down, forward, back, side, side. At a virtually open-ended conceptual level, it might be said to support, if not anchor, a disposition toward dynamic binary oppositions generally, as in weak, strong, near, far, in, out, fast, slow, tight, loose, straight, curved, sharp, blunt, and so on. And in a more extended sense, a disposition toward binary affective oppositional pairings, such as happy, sad, certain, doubtful, thoughtless, fearful, and so on, particularly in terms of either a contractive or expansive body. When it comes to animation and the possibilities of animate movement, it is in fact instructive to hone in on bipedality, and this because humans are not the only bipedal creatures. Long ago, I wrote an article titled Evolutionary Residues and Uniquenesses in Human Movement that was published in the journal Evolutionary Theory. I mention it here to call attention to evolutionary facts of life. In that article, I pointed out the seemingly limitless possibilities afforded to human movement 
in virtue of bi human bipedality, what Russian physiologist Nicholas Grimstone aptly termed degrees of freedom. I noted in particular how bipedality sizably expanded our possibilities in ballistic movement, movement that has an initial impulse and then travels on its own in virtue of its initial force, the momentum generated by that initial force and gravity. Skipping is one such example of ballistic movement. Kicking is another, arm swinging is another. Bipedality is integral to such movements. It frees not only arms and legs, but torso and head, the whole body, in myriad ways, and opens a path toward seemingly endless movement possibilities, including but not limited to ballistic movement. Mentioned earlier was an obs important observation attaching to this freedom, namely that humans are not the only bipedal creatures. They are furthermore not the only ones to improvise and play with movement and with movement possibilities. These evolutionary facts of animate life warrant recognition. And in fact, not just verbal recognition, but real life exemplification. do have, quote, rhythm, unquote. <laughs> in particular, the reporter wrote that after studying a cockatoo that moved in relation to a piece of popular music, quote, scientists say they documented for the first time that some animals dance to a musical beat. According to these scientists, 
14 species of parrots and one species of elephant have been found to move their heads rhythmically in conjunction with music, their heads bobbing to synchronize with the musical beat. That was a quote. Nothing further is mentioned of the one species of elephant, but we might note with respect to elephants the import of freely hanging parts that allow ballistic movement. <laughs> Rhythmic possibilities are inherent in such parts. When a sulfur-crested cockatoo, a species of parrot, was donated to the Bird Lovers Only Rescue Service in the state of Indiana in the U.S., quote, he was accompanied by a CD noting that he particularly liked a song performed by the Back Street Boys. <laughs> when the song was played, Snowball, the sulfur-crested cockatoo, began to bob to the beat, raising his legs, strutting and extending his crest in the dance. Now, rhythmical movement is commonly conceived as movement that flows forth with certain accents along an unfolding continuum, precisely as in rhythmical head movements in conjunction with music. In finer terms, however, rhythm is an inherent dimension of movement, specifically the tensional and projectional qualities of movement that describe its manner of release, sustained, abrupt, ballistic, collapsing. It's in and it's intensity. Rhythm is thus experienced readily kinesthetically and readily observed visually. Rather than investigating these kinesthetic and kinetic realities of rhythm and of movement generally, many, if not most, scientists find the ability of an animal to move in relation to the sounds that it hears to be a matter of brain circuitry. They, in fact, state categorically that, quote, the brain circuitry that allows animals to move to a musical beat is the same as the brain circuitry that lets people learn to talk and evidently also to dance or tap their toes to music." Unquote. In effect, not only are the inherent qualitative dynamics of movement ignored, but in essence, movement is regarded no more than an appendage to language. Obviously, the focal point of attention of these scientists is not on understanding the relationship of music to dance in terms of movement, rhythm, accent, and so on, nor to begin with the, nor to begin with the relationship of movement to morphology, namely that birds, like humans, are bipedal. Such scientists instead fix their attention on what, in today's neuroscience, amounts to the oracle at Delphi, namely, the brain, the place to which all questions concerning humans are addressed and from which all bona fide answers are sought. What should be of definitive interest and curiosity, namely movement and the relationship of movement or dance to music, give what gives way in present-day neuro and cognitive science to brain circuitry and language. Alas, movement, dance, and music are nowhere on present-day neuro or cognitive scientist maps. The brain, they say, is simply, quote, wired for dancing. Were he alive today, Charles Darwin would undoubtedly give far more <coughs> edifying analyses of a bird's moving to a musical beat, and this on the basis of bird song. What in his book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, he discusses over some 15 pages under the topic vocal and instrumental music. And on the basis of bird dances, what he discusses in the same book under the heading Love Antics and Dances. Although Darwin does not mention bipedality, he gives lucid, real-life descriptive analyses of the songs and dances of birds, and, the, and thus would eschew a reductionist explanation of a bird's ability to move to a musical beat. Indeed, he is at pains to describe in meticulous fashion the physiologies and morphologies that allow vocal and instrumental music. Music made by a rattling of quills, for instance, as with peacocks and birds of paradise, or a drumming of lower wings on a tree or against the body, as with grouse and pheasants. Toward the end of his examples and discussions thereof, Darwin puts the rhythmic or musical facts of bird life into evolutionary perspective, 
specifically into the perspective of sexual selection. He states, it is not difficult to imagine the steps by which the notes of a bird, primarily used as a mere call or for some other purpose, might have been improved into a melodious love song. This is somewhat more difficult in the case of the modified feathers by which the drumming, whistling, or roaring noises are produced. But we have seen that some birds, during the courtship, flutter, shake, or rattle their unmodified feathers together. And if the females were led to select the best performers, the males, which possess the strongest or thickest or most attenuated feathers situated on any part of the body, would be the most successful. And thus, by slow degrees, the feathers might be modified to almost any extent. The females, of course, would not notice each slight successive alteration in shape but only the sounds that were produced. It is a curious fact that in the same class of animals, sounds so different as the drumming of the snipe's tail, the tapping of the woodpecker's beak, the harsh trumpet-like cry of certain waterfowl, the cooing of the turtle dove, and the song of the nightingale shall all be so pleasing to the females of several species. But we must not judge the taste of distinct species by a uniform standard. Nor, he says, must we judge by the standard of man's taste. His second injunction is of particular important, import, in particular import given man's present day reductionist tastes. Indeed, Darwin wrote, quote, experience shows the problem of the mind cannot be solved by attacking the citadel itself. The mind is function of body. We must bring some stable, he's underscored that, italicized that, we must bring some stable foundation to argue from." Unquote. I have elsewhere shown how this stable foundation is movement. What? Someone might exclaim, how can movement be the stable foundation? It won't stay still. Precisely, I would answer. Animate minds are on the move in relation to themselves and to the world about them. In a word, they don't stay still. They are, in fact, mindful bodies on the move. A further observation is of note. Darwin observed that nothing is more common than for animals to take pleasure in practicing whatever instinct they follow at other times for some real good. Singing is to a certain extent, as shown in a previous chapter, an art, this is still Darwin writing, and is much improved by practice. Birds can be taught various tunes, and even the unmelodious sparrow has learned to sing like a linnet. They acquire the song of their foster parents and sometimes that of their neighbors. There are other, three other observations that are briefly notable. The first concerns Darwin's fine-grained specification of insect music. He begins his section on the biological order Homoptera, for example, with the following observation. Everyone who has wandered in a tropical forest must have been astonished at the din made by the male cicada. The sound is produced by the vibration of the lips of the spiracles, which are set into motion by a current of air emitted from the trachea. It is increased by a wonderfully complex resounding apparatus consisting of two cavities covered by scales. Hence, the sound may truly be called a voice. The second observation concerns amphibians. In remarking upon the musical powers possessed by the males, Darwin states, to speak of music when applied to the discordant and overwhelming sounds emitted by male bullfrogs and some other species seems, according to our taste, a singularly inappropriate expression. Nevertheless, certain frogs sing in a decidedly pleasing manner. Near Rio de Janeiro, I used often to sit in the evening to listen to a number of little hylae, which perched on blades of grass close to the water, sent forth sweet, chirping notes in harmony. Finally, it is notable that psychologist Havelock Ellis elaborates in thoughtful and culturally cognizant ways 
but Darwin first described under the heading Love Antics and Dances, and later simply as Male Love Dances. In particular, Ellis bases his thesis that the love dances of courting males, insects as well as birds, are the forerunners of human dance. He bases this research on Darwin's own research. Clearly, species other than humans make music. Music is obviously made by moving and does not in all instances require bipedality. In fact, when we consider ontogeny, our own human ontogeny, moving to a musical beat does not require bipedality at all. Again, this fact does not require simple verbal recognition, but real life exemplification. to the world around us, though that receptivity is surely not always positive. We may be motivated to turn away as well as toward objects or events in our surrounding world. Unless we are feigning or restraining our movement, there is a natural dynamic congruency between our affective feelings, our emotions, and our everyday movement. Indeed, we could hardly feign an emotion, smiling and opening our arms in the semblance of a fond feeling which we do not, in fact, feel, nor could we restrain our already tightening fists and felt urge to strike someone if our fists were not already clenched during the process of clenching and if we did not already precisely feel that felt urge. Music moves us to move not only because of its rhythmic patternings, but because of its tonalities, its harmonies, its crescendos and diminuendos, and much more. It has, like our bodies ourselves, vitality affects. This apt descriptive term, vitality affects, comes from the writings of infant psychiatrist and clinical psychologist Daniel Stern. He describes vitality affects as follows. Many qualities of feeling that occur do not fit into our existing lexicon or taxonomy of affects. These elusive qualities are better captured by dynamic, kinetic terms, such as surging, fading away, fleeting, explosive, crescendo, decrescendo, bursting, drawn out, and so on. These qualities of experience are most certainly sensible to infants and of great daily, even momentary importance. It is these feelings that will be elicited by changes in motivational states, appetites, and tensions. The different forms of feeling elicited by these vital processes impinge on the organism most of the time. We are never without their presence, whether or not we are conscious of them, while regular affects come and go. Stern goes on to say that infants experience these qualities from within, as well as in the behavior of other persons for example, as when a mother picks up her baby. He furthermore adds that the infant is immersed in these feelings of vitality, and that examining them further will let us enrich the concepts and vocabulary too impoverished for present purposes that we apply to nonverbal experiences. 
we are precisely affected by the vitality affects of music. We are precisely moved by music because music itself moves. It is not simply a temporal art form, but a moving form of art. The felt sense of the vitality affects of that moving form of art move us in concordant, affective ways. When music m literally moves us to move, it moves us along its qualitative, affective, kinetic dynamics. Precisely as we have seen in the infant video, and as we saw earlier, it moves other animate forms to move along its qualitative, affective, kinetic dynamics. It is important to call attention specifically, however, to the infant's position. In particular, in their easy and comfortable half-sitting, half-reclining position, infants can kick their legs and fling their arms about. Their degrees of freedom with respect to arms and legs are quite extraordinary with respect not only to other animate forms of life, but with respect to human adults who, unless they were gymnast dancers, for example, would be hard put to kick their legs and fling their arms about as the infant does in the video. That said, when it comes to making music, the possibilities and actual accomplishment of movement in a sitting posture are extraordinary. When we are at a concert and are attentive to the various members of the orchestra playing their instruments, we experience extraordinary subtleties and complexities in human movement. In all instances, musicians are doing two things at once, three of course if we count breathing. String players are fingering and bowing, wind players are fingering and blow fingering and bowing, sorry. Wind players are fingering and blowing or blowing and pulling back and, and pushing forward as trombonists do. The pianist is doing one thing with one hand and quite another with the other. Percussionists are striking with one mallet or stick while momentarily holding the other. While a conductor, like a cymbalist, moves his or her arms in sync with one another, a conductor more frequently gestures singly with one arm or differently and concurrently with both arms. In short, musicians are gifted through and through in complex and subtle coordination dynamics. I want to mention just on the side that coordination dynamics has to do with, uh, with very much with uh, J.A. Scott Kelso's work uh, in dynamic systems. And I would very heartily recommend uh, uh, as, a, as a way of approaching the brain in a way that recognizes experience in a developmental way, uh, his book, called Dynamic Patterns. Doing two things at once when playing an instrument such as bowing and fingering on the violin, blowing and fingering on the trumpet, or pedaling and hitting on drums is, as noted, complemented by a third movement, namely breathing, which adjusts itself naturally to the flow of music. Though breathing is not voluntarily initiated and carried out, it is involuntarily of a piece with the playing of the instrument. Indeed, the vitality affects of one's breath are of a piece with the vitality affects of the music one is playing. Think of a pianist coming down in a rapid and percussive series of chords. Is he or she inhaling or exhaling? It is relevant in this context to point out the relationship of breath to music when no instrument is being played. An opera singer is particularly challenged to work with breath along with his or her very production of sound, its pitch, its intensity, <clears throat> its timbre, and so on. It is rhythmically of interest, of course, that breathing is binary. Whatever is vocalized in singing must necessarily accord with that basic binary rhythm. Thus, however elongated or truncated each voluntarily made vocalized sound in terms of the demands of the arias, melody, or song being sung, its temporal flow and amplitude must be concordant with the possible temporal flow and amplitude of breath. It is relevant to note further that in addition to their musical significance, the cadences and flow of breath are or can be significant in and of themselves as Sir Charles reminds us in describing two men wrestling in the dark. Moreover, the limitations of breath are equally notable. 
as we ourselves might realize, it is impossible to sound a note, all energized and buoyant, and inhale at the same time. Just as it is impossible to jump, all energized and buoyant, and exhale at the same time. Clearly, inhaling and exhaling are a fundamental import in the making of music and dance, and may present formidable challenges to a performing dancer as to a performing musician. When we duly recognize the fundamental import of movement, vitality affects, and breath, we readily recognize that whether it is a matter of making music or dancing or wrestling, the whole body is involved, and further, that in the making of music in particular, there's a complex of both voluntar involuntary and spontaneous bodily movements and sound-making movements. Indeed, the spontaneous movement of musicians in performance involves the whole body in striking and unique ways. Performing musicians lean forward, backward, and even sideways. They shake their heads, they press down with their feet, and not just pianists in the process of pedaling. We may, in fact, no wonder to what degree we, as audience, implicitly read the dynamics of their spontaneously performing bodies in conjunction with the dynamics of the music they are making and that we are hearing. To my knowledge, no one has studied these spontaneous movements and their naturally synchronized dynamics, except perhaps by way of a funny and fun-poking Monty Python skit. It is difficult to imagine their dissynchronization. I would like now to relate the three basic themes of which I have spoken, movement, vitality, ethics, and breath, to Dalcroze's writings and practice, and this in order to emphasize the cogency of Dalcroze's work to education in music, dance, and art generally. Dalcroze wrote of movement, breath, and of emotions the latter similar to, if not the exact equivalent, of qualities of feeling that Stern describes as vitality affects, all in relation to music and music education and all of them themselves intermeshed. For example, in detailing the importance of what he termed restoring living or moving plastic, meaning restoring our awareness of bodily movement and its possibilities, Delcro's listed study of the effects of breathing on the different parts of the organism, both from the dynamic and from the spatial point of view. He further specified the importance of studying the relations between the effect of breathing on the expansion and contraction of the limbs in the vocal emission of sound, where spoken or sung. He wrote of the art of musical breathing. With respect to movement itself, we should note that although he never mentions kinesthesia, Dalcroze definitively emphasizes its seminal import over and over again, whether in terms of muscle sense, muscle sensations, muscular dynamics, muscle consciousness, or in more removed neurological motor talk. He is at pains to emphasize the value of freeing movement from disciplinary strictures, be they of classical ballet, gymnastics, or physical education, that limit the exploration of new paths that thus limit creativity. His emphasis is indeed on freedom of expression and on the pursuit of artistic emotion. If, as he writes, emotion of an aesthetic order is created by the harmonies and counterpoints of movements, then it is surely up to each of us to take up the challenge that our very animation poses to us, namely, to educate ourselves from the bottom up, as it were, that is, take into account the bodies we are and the bodies we are not, both phylogenetically and ontogenetically, and to resonate sufficiently in those awarenesses and understandings to arrive at ever-deepening understandings of the kinesthetic and kinetic dynamics that ground our lives and that are at the heart of artistic creation. As Dalcroze realized, those kinesthetic and kinetic dynamics, realized in rhythm, in continuous movement, in the technique of moving plastic, and in a host of other dimensions of animation, are at the heart of making music. They are all, each of them, open to study. Hence, they are all dimensions that can be part of a child's education. 
Dalcroze lamented that unfortunately the aim of education is often considered to be the developing of children to maturity in the shortest possible time. Education hastens to make them into men. This is a noble aim and undoubtedly the educator's task is largely to depart from the present in order to prepare and assure the future. But is it not of primary importance to assure the present and to allow the child to develop all the qualities of his age, to procure for him the innocent joys which should keep alive his freshness and his curiosity? In this age of information and in this age of emphasis on the brain, we would do well as educators to anchor ourselves in keeping freshness and curiosity alive. Through such anchorage, we keep receptivity and responsivity alive. In fact, we have the possibility of keeping it alive in relation to nature in the fullest sense, to the sound and sight of surging waves, the roaring of whistling winds, to the patter of raindrops, and so on to this fact that seedlings grow, that plants turn toward the sun, that tree cuts heal themselves, and so on. Dalcro's comments that the object of education is to enable pupils to say at the end of their studies, not I know, but I experience, and then to create the desire for self-expression. But to be noted too is that just a page later he states, the object of art studies is not solely to educate artists capable of communicating aesthetic impressions to the public. They also aim at forming a public able to appreciate the artistic representations afforded to it, to unite with them, and to be vividly conscious of the emotions manifested in them. Clearly, what Dalcroze envisions is a humanity alive to its natural artistic proclivities and possibilities. In sum, by keeping the fullest sense of nature in mind, what we learn from the study of animate life and of human nature in particular is precisely that the origin of music and dance, and indeed the very concept of music and dance, both owe much to our morphology and to the degrees of freedom inherent in that morphology. We are richly endowed to make music and to dance in virtue of the fact that we stand not on all fours but on two legs and have a spinal column unique in the world of both primates and avians. Whatever our cultural heritage and cultural groomings, however those heritages and groomings have been expressed in music and dance, and at whatever point in time we find ourselves in relation to our cultural history and groomings. Our cultural heritage and groomings have their foundation in nature. Indeed, our human morphology and the same qualitative dynamic structure of movement bind us all in a common humanity across all cultures, whatever their historical period. This natural perspective accords with Dalcroze's observation that, quote, from its birth, music has registered the rhythms of the human body of which it is the complete and idealized sound image and that emotions are tethered to these rhythms. Thank you very much.